I really must be nervous because I get really, as soon as I need to start talking into the mic, I really get like super dry mouth. Um, hmm. So I got nothing witty to say. I was thinking about something earlier to start off with. Now I completely forgot it. So also, I don't like how the shadow is. All right. Yeah, we're just going to do with that. All right. My name is Joseph Louthan. This is the, this is, well, not quite a Bible study. I'm going to call it a meditation, but I don't know how much introspection I am going to do. But uh, welcome to our Wednesday. Uh, we're going to break it up a little bit. Uh, if you missed the announcement from Monday, uh, we're doing Mondays is Bible study in Romans. Wednesday at this time, 5 p.m. Central, we're going to do a meditation on the pastoral epistles. And so if you go to theologic.us, uh, you can click on meditations and boom, you'll get right there to the sh uh, show notes. Now, uh, and of course on Friday, uh, for those who missed the, um, the announcement, uh, that will be family devotions in the gospel of Mark. Uh, I'm going to walk you through Mark, but it will be, uh, pretending like you're going to do it for your household, your family. Uh, and I'm not just talking, you know, mom, dad, kiddos and stuff like that. I mean, like your grandma or, you know, who lives with y'all or, you live at home with your parents, or uh, you're a bunch of singles in a home. Well, I think uh, keep things really basic, but focus in on Christ uh, and the gospel, and uh, trying to. It's it's all about when you're leading devotions, when you're leading uh, Bible studies, when you're. It's asking more questions than than giving uh, a lot of information. Keeping the dialogue, like trying to fire up the dialogue. You would be surprised. Um, I've done devotions with uh, an age range of like five years old to 12. And y y you, I think this is the work of the Holy Spirit because you can like start like kind of read uh, kids or you can read the audience in the room and kind of like, you know, try to ask questions that are like thought, thought provoking. Um, and not just one word answers, yes, no, maybe, or whatever. And there's a couple of things in there because there's you're going to get some hard-hitting uh, theological truths that need to be expressed in the devotion so that they would learn the character, and that everybody involved will learn the char character of God. And um, so, but today, uh, that's, that's for Friday, not today. Today, we're going to do... Uh, meditations in the pastoral epistles. Now, uh, I gave you a little background of like why meditations, why pastoral epistles. Well, I don't want this like it's definitely not commentary level. It's definitely not even Bible study. I didn't want to go like super in depth, but I needed to write my like my thoughts on the pastoral epistles. Now, I was like I said, uh, my mentor just brought it up. Like, hey, maybe perhaps we can go through. Uh, first and second Timothy and Titus, and there was a little bit of like philosophy of ministry discussion and stuff like that. But this is really where it sparked off up. You're gonna see this backwards, I think. Yeah, it's gonna be backwards. But anyway, if you can't read this, and I don't have the book jacket for it, this is Ashamed of the Gospel by John MacArthur. It's published. It was uh, I forgot who did it. Christian book. Uh, it is what's printing in 93. This edition is 93. I don't know if there's any other editions. So it's 1993. You have to keep that in mind. Um, a lot of the things that, uh, John MacArthur talks about, like some of the warnings that he gives, the dangers, it's very, I call it prophetic. Uh, I think that's the true, the true definition of prophetic is that, if we keep going the way we're going, this is where we're going to end up. And he, I mean, this is like over t about 20 years. Actually a lot longer than that. It's about now my math is way off. Let's say carry the one 20, about 25 years. Yeah. 25, 26 years ago. So 
uh, it's it's worth the read on that. And it's definitely not outdated. But here's the thing. Uh, if you go to, and I just had this, he gets the um, the challenge. He gives the, okay, here it is. Uh, he gets, uh, John MacArthur gives the challenge. It's like, you know, what is, he, he just like explain what is the philosophy of ministry. And I like to summarize it as this is, why do you do the things you do in ministry? Why do you minister? And and not given like pat answers or like whatever's off the top of my head. It's like, why do we do kids church the way we do? If you even have a kids church and the reason why. That's philosophy of ministry. Why do we take up offering or do we just have people drop it in a bucket? Philosophy of ministry. Communion every week or once a month or or twice a year. Uh, infant. I would even say, like, when you talk about baptisms, infant versus uh, believer um, credo baptism, um, I think that's more doc. I think I would call that doctrinal. That's not really philosophy of ministry. Um. Oh, Pastoral care. How do you go about doing pastoral care? Are all the pastors responsible or some of that that weight of pastoral care is first on uh, the saints? See, you know, you can make a contention there for Ephesians 4. Um, so on and on. So anyway, in this book, and looking around, look on, start on page 24. I was at my previous church. And I'm not bad about them or anything like that. It was just like my philosophy. Like I was trying to, it's like, let me, let me think through what I'm saying. I wanted to do ministry this way because of these reasons, which I thought were biblical and they don't necessarily oppose the church I was going to at the time. Uh, but they certainly did not line up. And and this is naive me. I've only been saved 14 years. So very not naive, a little bit young. Like I thought foolishly that if I was a pastor on staff, that I can kind of change the church. That can change the culture of the church. Oh, so silly. That was so silly. So young. It's a few years ago. Three years ago, I was so young. Um, but what he did, what he, John, challenges the reader is to examine your church's philosophy of ministry against 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. So, with that being said, we, that's what we're going to do. And uh, I've written it out. I'm about uh, several, actually several weeks out. I'm all the way to the end of 5, 1 Timothy 5. Uh, I have uh, the rest of 1 Timothy. I got 2 Timothy and Titus all planned out. Um, but if you want to get ahead... Here, here are the notes. They're right there. Um, and, and keep in mind that, like, even, like, in preparation for today, I went back and I was like, well, let me read what I wrote, you know? And I was like, hmm, I was a little bit, like, I wouldn't call it, it wasn't, like, thought out. So I went back and kind of, like, fleshed things out. And so, also, I was in prayer today in preparation for this moment. And I was like, I noticed that I don't, I pray at the end, but I really don't pray ahead of time. Um, so I'm going to do prayer and I hope that's okay. Um, Father God, uh, I thank you for the grace that you have given me in this moment right now. I thank you for the joy that you have set before me. And I thank you. I thank you that your son saved me. I thank you that your spirit uh, lives in me. I thank you for your grace that you have bestowed upon me. Um, Lord, whatever, help me to speak about you, to tell the world about who you are and about what your son has done. Um, Help me to lift up the name of Christ. Help me to point anybody who would listen to this right back to your son. Be glorified in this moment. We love you so much. In your son's name I pray. Amen. So, 
I call this the meditations on the epistle, pastoral epistles. Mm, we're going to start off with 1 Timothy 1 through 11, uh, Christ our grace. Okay, so here's the text. Uh, starting at verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the command of God our Savior and Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. As I urge you, when I went to Macedonia, I remained in Ephesus so that Remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach false doctrine or pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. Now, these promote empty speculations rather than God's plan, which operates by faith. Now, the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Some have departed from these and turned aside to fruitless discussion. They want to be teachers of the law, although they don't understand what they are saying or what they are insisting on. But we know that the law is good provided one uses it legitimately. We know that the law is not meant for a righteous person, but for the lawless and the rebellious, for ungodly and sinful, for the unholy and irreverent. I can't say that right. For those who killed their fathers and mothers, for murderers, for the sexual immoral and males who have sex with males, for slave traitors, liars, perjurers, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine that conforms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which is entrusted to me. Now, here we go. Also, I kind of realize that you guys are following along in the video. You're following along uh, in the stream and you're looking at the show notes. I also record this to a podcast, which you may be driving and or like otherwise occupied and not able to read along as I go along. Give me a second. All right. Um, so, uh, when I I want to structure my notes out like this, as you can see, that each of the lines we're going to focus on, those are kind of like bolded. Uh, but when I transition to like the next verse, um, I'm going to give some kind of heads up. Let's continue something like that. Because again, you guys may be just listening as opposed to reading this. So. Starting in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace and mercy and peace from God the Father and the Christ Jesus our Lord. My meditation from this passage is that there is only one God. He is the maker of heaven and earth. Grace and mercy and peace come only from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We stand on the foundation of Christ, whom has used the apostles and the early church to build his kingdom. And let's continue. As I urge you, when I went to Macedonia, or is it Macedonia? Macedonia, ah, uh, remain in Ephesus that you may instruct certain people not to teach false doctrine or pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. These promote empty speculations rather than God's plan, which operates by faith. Something just jumped out at me. I remember being told, being taught, that Timothy was the elder, uh, the pastor at the church at Ephesus. This is uh, 1 Timothy 1. We know this. Well, why is that so important? Uh, I'm going to do this really quick. This is getting off subject, but I'm going to do this real quick. I'm going to show you. Okay. Let's go to, uh, now, now we know that F, uh, church in Ephesus, uh, what does that mean to us? We go to Ephesians 1, consider the content of Ephesians 1, right? What did, what did Paul express to the church in Ephesus? Think about that, right? Now, we just said... Timothy is an elder of the church of Ephesus. So Paul again is writing two more letters to the church in Ephesus, right? Protect yourself from false doctrine, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Where else have we seen a letter of sorts being told, to, uh, being written to Ephesus? 
and that would be Revelation. So the letters to the seven churches. You get, you get, I don't, I can't tell you where the letters to Timothy and the letters to the Ephesians, where they kind of chronologically, there's, there's people, seminarians who know that there's probably those who really are, know the new Testament. Well, I don't know the, the order of that, but I do know that this letter to, um, Jesus from Jesus Christ to the church in Ephesus, this is where they, I, I would say this happened at the end or towards the end. This is where Ephesus ended up at. Write to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Thus says the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven go- golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, and your endurance, and that you cannot tolerate evil people. So far, so good. You have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and you have found them to be liars. Man, hitting on all cylinders. And know that you have uh, persevered and endured hardships for the sake of my name, and you have not grown weary. Verse 4, read this. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the love that you had at first. Remember that how far you have fallen. Christ is telling the church in Ephesus to repent and do the works you did at first. Otherwise, I will not come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet, you you do have this. You hate the practices of the... Ni- I can't even pronounce that. Uh, Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has ears to hear the, what... Listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will give the right to eat. From the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So that that could be a little homework for you. That could be like, oh, I would like to uh, know more. Um, check how, like, what the New Testament, uh, follow along and kind of read Ephesians, kind of read uh, uh, letters to Timothy, and then proceed to and kind of keep in mind well, where, did, where did they go astray? What was their first love? That's for you. To go and find out. So, anyway. Uh, and sorry, I'm not right up on the mic. Because I know that I can also know that if I get away, it's going to sound really, uh, really quiet. So, I have to be right up on the mic. Okay, hold on a second. That war is not special. Not lemonade either. All right. And let us continue. All right. As I urge you, as I urge you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus so that you may instruct certain people not to teach false doctrine or to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. These promote empty speculations rather than God's plan, which operates by faith. So, once upon a time in my own lifetime, I feel like Either we as a people didn't face such misinformation as we do today, or I was too young and naive to actually pay attention. Uh, I actually lived in a time before the the before the internet took place, so to speak. The internet's been around as long as I have, but in the public sector, uh, it came around when I was about in high school. So that's how old I am. Uh, so you're talking about maybe early mid nineties and uh we we descended i'm going to call it ascended into the age of information uh as we do so over the last 20 years 20 30 years uh we have certainly not become wiser smarter or even more moral the age of information has proven one thing to be true most of us have already decided what is good, true, and right, and we will only seek sources of information that confirms and coddles what is right in our own minds. Now, some of us would dare use God's name in vain to convince ourselves that we know what is right and good is actually right and good. This may be harsh and judgmental, and I'm saying that this in the context of most of us, I'm not saying all of us, 
but I'm definitely not saying some of us or a very few of us have not been led astray with misinformation. Uh, you can talk about politically. I'm speaking theologically. I'm speaking religiously. I'm speaking doctrinally. Uh, we live in a day of time where we are picking out what we get to follow of God and of Christ and what we get to pick and choose uh, what is good for us. Now, Humans, from the beginning of time, have decided what was right in their own eyes. This is this is the entire Bible, but if you really want to see that come to fruition, look at the book of Judges. Sorry, I'm I uh, in radio. I know there's on their mics. There's like a cough button, and I probably need one of those. Uh, so I'm having a little bit of a cough. So I don't want to cough into the mic. So uh, that's where those pauses are at. So bear with me. Um, some of us would, um, it even, even, even in our best intentions, we, when we're, we're led astray, we're, we're being misinformed, uh, we're letting the world dictate what we know about God, what we know about Christianity, what we know about the Bible, uh, and some people would actually use God's name in vain in order to kind of win an argument. And this is what I would call, this is the downfall of Christians. If we have already made up our minds about what is right and yet have a low understanding of the Bible, then we get to the parts of the Bible that tell us we are wrong. This is what happens. There are three things that happen, okay? Either we're wrong, uh how it was taught to us or who taught it to us was actually not all the way correct or wrong. Uh, or number three, the Bible's wrong. Now I would hope and I, it, for the listener, I hope you hope this as well, that, that we, 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 we make up our minds and may, maybe we just don't know what the Bible says about this thing or that thing. Right. Um, we have our own opinion about that. It actually kind of forms into like, yeah, this is a fact that this is uh this is actually legitimate. But what happens if you, by God's grace, engage the word of God, there, there's gotta be, you're going to come upon something that you're going to have to choose one way or the other. Are you right? Or is God right? And I wish and prayed and hope that number one, we are wrong would be the most common response among Christians. Sadly, from my perspective, it is the least common because we have so much more information at our fingertips that we can confirm what we think is right. We, we just go find the information that, that just confirms how we feel or what we think. And then all of your information will overshadow and almost, I would say, almost outvote what is absolute truth. But here's the thing. Scripture is where God has truly revealed himself to us. You might want God to do a certain thing or look the other way on certain sins. Or you, want, you might want God to be a one way. But where God has been cleared to reveal himself to us, we... And if our minds are not lined up with that, and especially our hearts are not lined up to, with that, well, God is calling us to repent of that and renew our minds, change our minds accordingly. Now, here's the point of all this. How did God reveal himself in Scripture? Well, the way he has revealed himself is one name, Jesus Christ. And here's, here's what I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go very, very specific on this. You're like, you're, I think you have a bone to pick, Joe. Well, I think you're probably right. Um, amongst everything that is blowing my mind in this time and age, uh, the, the rise of our identification, the world's identification in either their sexual preference or their gender has come to fruition. Older folks, Boomers and all that, they're like, yeah, whatever. This is like, you know, I don't have time. I'm too old. This is ridiculous. This is laughable, whatever. And they just not, not going to try to wrap their minds around it. But the generations, younger generations that engage with more and more information. And these are a lot. I'm making a lot of general assumptions. 
but I also can tell you what I've seen other people go through. Is they, they believe a certain thing about themselves, which stands in antithesis, uh, in opposite of what God has said about them. And what God is calling them to do. And what God has beckoned them to do. Right? Uh, that's just not an option for them. The way God has said it or the way God has uh, laid it out for us, that's not even an option. But let me go and explore and examine and like flesh out and totally wring it dry all the world that it has to offer. My point is this. We're, you're going to talk about sexual preference. You're going to talk about gender identification. Fine. Let's do that. Um, you you want to place those monikers. You want to place those adjectives upon like I am that way in a Christian. Okay. Okay. Let's let's do that. And and then you the argument might be that you've heard uh, elsewhere that it's for instance it's not sin to be gay. You know. Um. Uh, it's it's not a sin to change your change your uh, gender. This is just the way you're born. This is just the way you're made. Well, I'm gonna. What I find fascinating is that when that is presented, when I hear those arguments coming up, in in light of who God is, what I found fascinating is that where God has been explicitly clear about what is sin and what is trespass against him. It's, but he is the one who offers the solution. See, like the solution that, that the world is offering is like, you just, you just go change your gender or you just change your sexual preference. It, it's not really a big deal, but God is saying, you don't, you don't have to like identify yourself with something that's not God. You, you, he's, He's asking you to identify yourself with his son. Now, when you do that, those things that he has called sin, like sexual immorality, so I'm just going to paint the entire picture of everything that is included. I don't... It's the whole, the whole gambit. But the thing about it is, is that because of his son, he's the one who offers the solution. He's the one who... He's like, you trust in my son. By that means, it's like, you can take your sins, all of them, even the ones you want to hang on to because they make you, they they help you protect yourself or you think that's going to make you the most happiest or whatever the case may be. Whatever your mind is, is just cracked by that. He's like, I need you to change your mind about this. But I also need you to change your life on this. But if 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 you give that sin over to his son, then that sin no longer belongs to you. It belongs to him. But you're you're trying to like trying to sin, but yet stay in Christ. Do you see how that that's it it doesn't work. They're at odds with one another, but yet Christ came to save his people from their sins. Do you see what I'm saying? He was cru- Jesus was crucified 2,000 years ago. And I make this very, very, very blatant analogy. What are you going to do? You're going to hold on to that sin so hard that you're willing to go back in time, climb that bloody, piss, feces-soaked cross, and extract your sin from his blood? First of all, that's not even possible. I'm getting to a point. I know that was gross, but I'm going to get to a point. This is a point I'm going to make. Hebrews 9, uh, starting at verse 27, just as it was appointed for people to die once and after this judgment, so also Christ, who have been who having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Here is what the gospel of God calls you to do right now. You ready? Repent because the kingdom of God is here. That, that's your only way of being saved. Now, 
if you don't like, it's like, okay, well that's just way too hard. Okay. So I could either stop believing God or just like, know for a fact he doesn't exist. Okay. Well, you're going to, you're going to have to hypocritically, you're going to have to deny a lot of truths that are in the world, but okay, I'll give you that. Um, you're going to have to say, well, God is not this way when in fact God says he is this way. Well, I'll say, okay, well, that that's not going to work out. What the well, when you examine all the other ways other than to repent, other than to trust in God, you end up your other choices don't repent and let the wrath of God just remain upon you. That's John three thirty six. So let me continue on. Now the goal of our instruction is the love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience and a sincere faith. This is why Paul instructs in the middle of eagerly desiring the gifts of the Spirit, such as prophecy and praying in tongues in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14. In the middle of those two chapters, you have the chapter of 13, chapter 13, which they call the love chapter, but it's a not a complete name, but it gets to the point. In the midst of instruction on how to minister to one another, here is the Here's the, the heart of that, literally, is that we should do all things in love. If we're to minister, we have to do so in love. So what did Christ say were the greatest commandments in the Bible? Love God and love one another. Everything that we do or we think we do in the name of God is for nothing if we do not sincerely love the people we are called to minister to. Let's continue on. Some have departed from these all these things, and turned aside to fruitless discussion. They want to be teachers of the law, although they don't understand what they are saying or what they are insisting on. But we know that the law is good, providing one uses it legitimately. And we know that the law was not meant for righteous, for a righteous person. Whoa. And for the, but for the lawless and rebellious, and for the ungodly and sinful, for the unholy and irrelevant, for those who kill their fathers and mothers, for the murderers, for the sexual immoral, and for the males who have sex with males, for slave traders, liars, perjurers, uh, and for whatever else is contrary to the sound doctrine and confirms to the gospel concerning the glory of the blessed God, which is entrusted to me. And the I think the one thing, one of the verses that really jumps out is that we know that the law is good providing that we use it legitimately okay we we see that but we know that the law wasn't meant for uh, a righteous person but for the lawless and rebellious and i was like where how do we know this first of all we know that christ has fulfilled the law and the prophets we know that and not one bit of it will ever pass away because it's all fulfilled in him. But here's, I'm going to, I'm going to show you where Paul alludes to. What is he alluding to right now? So let me, let me get you over to the Bible and check out, look up Romans eight. Now read this with me. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because the law of the spirit of life is Christ in Christ. Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, since it is weakened by the flesh, God did. He condemned sin in the flesh by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh as a sin offering. In order that the law's requirement would be fulfilled, which we talked about that, and that's in Matthew 5, um, in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So you see right here, I don't know if you can see this highlight, for the what the law could not do, Since it was weakened by the flesh, God did. Here's the the point, folks. Here's the point. Is that the law was never meant to save us. So think about that. Like, you're going to try over your own power, obey the law, law of God, in order to maybe save yourself or count yourself as holy. And I'm going to tell you, there are so many religious systems out there that that do just that, that teach such that. There, there are denominations within uh, uh, within Christianity. Um, 
who who have been led astray, who have been they they've gone off the tracks. And we talked about like when we that we mentioned that passage in Revelation, you have came away from your first love, your first love being God. You're you're you are, you locked it down. You you're anti. You you have checked people who have called themselves apostles. You have tested that. You, all those things are good, but if you do it with that love, love for God and love for your neighbor, it's all for nothing. It's literally for nothing. This is the 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 full title of Revelations is not Revelations, but it's the revelation of Jesus. Christ. Christ. This is Jesus Christ making this judgment. You can, when you engage like Paul or your least favorite author in the Bible, you can like argue around that. But when Jesus Christ himself is speaking, you want to talk about being a red letter Christian. Well, there it is. He's, it's, it's not enough to obey God because here's the thing. I want to say in James, it's like, if you, if you, if you fail to follow the law once, you're guilty of the, breaking the whole thing. Well, okay, that's all of us, right? God demands perfection because he is perfect. And you're like, man, that's too much for us to handle. <gasps> oh, but wait a second. He sends his son, Jesus Christ. He sends his son like that yoke, that burden, that weight, that crushing weight of perfection. Hey, that's not on you. That's on his, that's on his son. That's where your sins and when you fail and sins are when you overtly uh, do the wrong thing or you fail to do the right thing. That's a sin. Well, you take that, put it on Christ. Let him bear that burden, and he's asking for it. He's like, give it to me. I'm going to give you my righteousness. You give me your sins because my righteousness is easy. And it's the light. And, and only then will you be free. But until then, in sin, you're shackled up. You're in prison. Prisoners, prisoners can only act like prisoners. Sinners only sin. They don't know how to be righteous. Now, I'm going to use this illustration one billion times. So just, if you get tired of it, too bad. It's the only one I got. You can take two people. One is in Christ. The other is not in Christ. They do the exact same thing. Who did the holy works? Who did the good works? Well, if they did the exact same thing, they both did. That's what the world is saying. As long as we're doing good things, it, it, it doesn't matter. We're just basically good people. And Christ, and, and God says, no, we've all fallen short. We've all broken the law of God. We're all falling short. We're going to, it's going to, I'm going to put it this way. Let me get back to my screen. We've all fallen short. We have no perfection of our own. So within that realm of perfection, what we would understand as perfection, we have righteousness, we have holiness, we have just, all these things from God. It would almost be like, and I said this, the other day in Romans, it would almost be like we would need somebody else's righteousness for ourselves. So that that passage in Matthew 11, I think it's Matthew 11, 29, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. How, how Paul describes that, he goes, well, God is trying to make an exchange with you. He's like, he's beckoning you, repent, the kingdom of God is now. Love the Lord your God with all your soul, with all your might, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. He's like, like, how do you, how did Paul explain that? Well, that's Second Corinthians five twenty one. For our sake, he became sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of him. Okay. All that to say is that this passage right here. And seeing this, I don't speak as somebody who's like just been saved just yesterday and kind of don't see like, you know, I, I, only, I don't know this in theory. I know this in practice. I know it experien experientially. I know it because I experienced it. This really hurts my heart because I've known way too many people who have turned away from the gospel only 
to increase the law. What I mean by that is like they turn away from the gospel. They turn away from salvation. Uh, they turn away from a, a preaching church that, that is, is begging them to return back. Return back and give your sin over to God. And they're like, no, 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 no. I'm just going to go just do my own way or whatever. When that happens, like the more you, that you're in sin, the, the law of God, which is holy and good, will only expose more sin that, that it only exposes a sin that they don't want to repent of. And this is what you're like, okay, well, we get grace, but yeah, but grace doesn't, Grace doesn't like, oh, just just hides God's eyes from your sin. No. Uh, Romans 6, you know the passage. Romans 6, uh, starting in verse 1. What shall we say then? Should we continue in sin so that grace may multiply? Absolutely not. That's the bastardization of grace. Like, if you're like, oh, uh, I'm going to sin so God can give me more grace. Let's think about that. No. Paul in Romans would go on to say, how can we die to sin, still live in it? If we believe in Christ, that means our sin is placed upon Christ and was so 2,000 years ago. When he was buried in the ground, our sins went with him in the ground. But two things went into the ground. One came back up. Who was that? Jesus Christ. Why? Because he was holy. He was righteous. He was perfect. He uh, pleased the Father in his actions, in his life. And he was obe- obedient. Sin is dead. Sin is dead in you. It no longer rules in you. You're going to read that. If you keep reading Romans after 6, it's going to say rule. It Even sin may like infect my members of my flesh. Like There's parts of me, parts of my mind or whatever, and I just don't understand it. Who? And it's going to go on and say, who's going to save me from this body of death? Well, guess who's going to save you? Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. Therefore... There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Okay? If sin no longer rules in us because we're in Christ, then death no longer rules over him. For the death, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all time. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you two could consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. But see, here's the thing. Repentance, you're called to repent. This is the gospel calling. You're called to repent. You're called not just to sin no more, but to change your life. But that is a gift from God. That's going to require faith. That's going to require a regenerate heart, a brand new heart. It's going to require the spirit, the spirit of God in you. It's going to require everything that you don't have in order to do that. And... I'm gonna, I, I, as their friend, as, as somebody who is aware of what we've been commissioned to do, I can only say, I can only proclaim the gospel to them. But will God give them repentance? I pray. And that's all I can do is ask God, God, give them repentance. I can think, when I'm saying this, I'm thinking of like these people, you know, I have a list of people and they have just run hard after not God. And I pray, I pray for their repentance. I repay, pray that they would come back. I pray that one day, and maybe I just don't know for the rest of my life, and I don't know where they go. But my hope is that when we when we see God, we're with God forever and ever. Like I'm going to turn around, they're going to be right there, and that's my prayer. And if you don't know God, and and now I find out your name, I'm going to start praying for you. Uh, and I'm going to pray for you every day, and I hope that you know God. So here is, uh, we're going to close this out in prayer, and uh, this is my prayer for today. The Savior of the world, you are the way, the truth, and the light, and no one comes to the Father, my God, but by you. You are the only one who gives us grace upon grace, mercies new every morning, and peace beyond all understanding. These, this These things are only from God, and you are the source of all things good, and you give freely to all who would receive it. My Lord, 
there has been so many who have lived in your goodness and mercy and then stepped away for one reason or another because of wounds, hurts, scars, pain, sometimes sin, and holding on to the only thing they have known more than you. But my father, I saw you be there for your children when you rescued them and they went back to their vomit. They urged to go back to slavery to sin instead of enjoying the freedom, the glory of being your precious children. Satan is ruthless and relentless and he preys on us because he is a wolf sending out his wolves into the sheep's den. Jesus, be my good shepherd. Protect us, love us, and keep us. Beat back the wolves with your iron rod and your staff. It comforts me all the days of my life. So be our pastor and send help. Amen. So there's my meditation on 1 Timothy uh, chapter 1. To, uh, next Wednesday, uh, same time, we are going to do 12 through 17. And if it looks like I'm real excited because I'm super excited, uh, go ahead and read that passage. And if you are so inclined, uh, I encourage you to memorize it. It's a wonderful, wonderful prayer of thanksgiving to God. Uh, I just go ahead and go ahead and cheat, read it, and uh, come back and join us uh, Wednesday on the channel uh, in a couple days uh, on Friday at five o'clock about this time, uh, right before my supper. Uh, we're gonna do family devotions in Mark. It's kind of like a two for. It's like we're gonna go through Mark, but we're also like, how do we? How do we talk to kids about this? How do we talk to our families, our parents, or how do we talk to our roommates about this? And you know, let's let's all simplify it. That's why I'm using the Gospels. Let's all simplify it and uh, and just equip or just get it equipped, and you can lead these, and it'll be amazing. Join us. I love you. Uh, oh, oh, and one thing. I don't know uh, if you can see this, but all you see all the social media, all the social media. Uh, and actually, there's a couple missing here, but that's no big deal. Uh, let me go. I'm going to show you the, the master list. The master list. Okay, we have uh, Twitch, which you're on right now. And I have the new, uh, if you're like, how do I memorize you know, where you're at? Twitch dot theologic.us oh you're gonna see a pattern here uh discord discord.theologic.us if you click on this you're gonna get an invite and you're gonna come into the chat channel if you want to chat you know i'll be there i'm always on discord uh 12 hours a day um youtube youtube dot theologic.us just type that in you'll go redirect it right to the channel so uh unfortunately i'm not going to do that for twitter and stuff like that I don't care that much. Um, so, but I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Facebook. Yeah. Barely. I'm barely on there. Uh, also, and last but not least, this little kitty cat. I know it's cute, but that is GitHub. So if you're interested in like, oh, uh, what do you, what do you do kind of for a living? Well, I try to waste time with God, but also have, if you're into that sort of thing, uh, theologic.us is based out, out of this repository. And I have some, some other tools in there and stuff like that. Ain't that fancy, but, uh, go ahead and take a look, see, see if you like it. You know, uh, anything is in there useful. And if you have any questions, you can always drop me a line in here too. That if you know what GitHub is, you know what GitHub is. If you don't just totally ignore this part of the, the video. Anyway, See you later. See you on Friday. Uh, and later.